Glad to see you all again. We're going to now hand this over to Susan McSpadden, our communications chair, to introduce our featured speaker. Susan. Hey, everybody. Um, I just want to also remind you that you are welcome to put your questions for Robin in the chat. Just know that we're not going to address those until the end of her presentation, but we'll definitely uh, keep up on all of those so that we get all those answers. Uh, voted by Life Magazine as one of the top eight photographers in America at the age of 24 and voted by Seattle Magazine as one of the most influential people of 2020, Robin Layton is a multifaceted person who claims many titles, including Pulitzer Prize nominee, Nikon ambassador, artist, antique collector, music lover, photojournalist, and filmmaker. There is probably a full presentation that could easily come from each one of those distinctions, but today Robin is here to talk to us about the power of personal projects. For her project Hoop, The American Dream, Robin traveled to 35 states looking for unique basketball hoops and the childhood hoops of some of the most revered players of our time, including LeBron James, Shaquille O'Neal, Sue Bird, Pat Summit, and many more. Robin also studied and photographed Lake Washington for an entire decade, culminating in a book aptly titled The Lake. The Labor of Love showcases stunning artistic photographs divided into four seasons. Each of the 2000 printed copies is signed as a limited edition piece of art and Robin swears there will never be a reprint. These are just two examples of a half dozen or so projects that turned into books. Robin, thank you again for being with us today. We're so excited to hear more about the power of personal projects. The Zoom floor is yours. Oh, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Susan. And thank you everybody for having me. And, and thank you for those that are attending. I really, really appreciate it. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Let's see. Let's see if you guys can, whoops. Can you, there we go. Can you guys see that okay? Whoops, what's happening? Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, we hear you. Yeah, we can, can hear you. Can you see my screen okay? Okay, great. Yeah, that looks good now. Now, now that looks great, yeah. Okay, great. Um, as Susan said, I wanna to talk today about the power of personal projects. Um, I was a photojournalist for um, 16 years and I, First of all, hold, hold on a second, everybody. I'm having issues with my screen here. Try okay. clicking on the screen. There there. Hey go. there, I don't know what's happening. I'm having problems here. Um, I was a photojournalist for 16 years. Um, I knew at 15 years old what I wanted to do. I was one of the lucky ones. I, I know a lot of people struggle, like what do I wanna do in my life? But I was sitting on a couch in Richmond, Virginia, and I was looking at a National Geographic magazine and I had always looked at um, photographs and would make scrapbooks. My mom was really big into scrapbooking. And, you know, I would see the picture of a giraffe with the sun, so, you know, silhouette in front of a sun in Africa. And so I would make scrapbooks alongside my mom. And one day I was looking at a National Geographic magazine and I was looking at these photographs. So I'm like, oh my gosh, I would give anything to take photos like these. And, and my mom said without skipping a beat, you know what? You can do that for a living if you want. And I took my hand and I slapped it on my lap and I said, this is what I want to do. So I, about a week later, I went to my guitar lesson and um, I would, the owner who was never there was there stringing a guitar. And he's like, hey, Rob, um, your teacher's running late. So why don't you hang out with me? I said, okay. And he's like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I said, I'm going to be a National Geographic photographer. And he said, really? did you know that one of our students dad is a national geographic photographer and i went no way and right then on cue this door opens with the bells on it and here comes this woman and he says in fact here comes his wife now and i just went oh my gosh and so it ended up being david allen harvey's wife i'm sure you guys know of him um, really world renowned photographer um that works for geographic on this used to be on the staff of geographic and he actually uh, mentored me and, you know, she gave me her number and her address and I ended up going to their house. And so he told me the best school in the country was Ohio University. And that's where I applied. And when I got to Ohio University, I realized I wanted to be a photojournalist because I would see pictures from other students of, you know, rugby players and all these wonderful moments. And I thought, that's what I want to do. I want to, I want to capture moments. So when I started, it was, you know, black and white and mostly, and then um, we would have to develop, 
you know, our pictures um, in the dark room on deadline. So uh, I worked at five different newspapers. I was the first female photojournalist ever hired in Sandu Sandusky Register. And um, I, you guys, I'm having issues with my screen and I'm not sure why. So this does not have, whoops, I apologize. Sorry, I'm, I'm having technical difficulties here. Um, so my job from the newspaper was to, to capture moments, to capture, you know, football games. Um, sometimes I would have to go to, oh, by the way, I love to incorporate art with my photojournalism. That's when I think um, the picture sing is when you can do a moment and do it artistically. Um, I had to photograph, um, okay, now I'm, <laughs> you guys, I've done this a million times. I'm not sure what's happening. <laughs> my mouse is uh, kind of acting weird. Um, and I would also have to look for pictures, um, like drive around and look for, you know, moments or people in the sprinkler. And this is actually in Sandusky, Ohio. Um, it was a kid running on top of a, a, like a salt pile covered with a protective sheeting. And this ran huge in the paper as well. A lot of portraits. Um, one of my favorite things to do is to put a subject in the doorway, just open the door and um, if there's nothing white in the background, it usually just goes black. And I think that light is absolutely beautiful. One day I was walking at the park with my friend in this cloudy, cool Seattle day and um, her dog just stopped on this path. And um, I, I love this photo. I like, the, I like having space. You'll see a theme in my photos. I try to shoot clean and the background is just as important to me as the foreground. And it it's, seems like there's a lot of space for the images to breathe. This is a really cool little sweet moment. It was in Cleveland and uh, capturing this bike riot. And I love this sweet moment um, and which could sometimes be a tough you know, situation. But um, that was my job to look for, look for moments, constantly looking for little, little tiny uh, times and time. And like this one was the bicentennial and these women were sitting on a bench getting ready to go to the celebration. I just love how they're doing something different. So I started out in black and white. That was the, that was where my background came, you know, developing in the dark room, like I said, and uh, in do, printing in the dark room, printing prints and handing them to the editor. That's, that's where I started. This is a hundred year old um, gentleman that was uh, celebrating his hundredth birthday. And uh, I love the, the graphics of the chairs and the picture of Jesus. In Seattle, I'm kind of known for this image. This is a picture that was voted best picture of the uh, sports picture of the decade. And what happened with this was, I'm sure you guys know that first base is the prime spot to photograph baseball. And third base is the second prime spot and press box is the third best. So um, I had been assigned to third base during the, the series and it was um, the Yankees versus uh, Mariners. And we were the bad news bears. We never got into the playoffs for years and years and years. So when I came to Seattle, I'd only been in town four months and I was the only girl, I was always the only girl on every paper I've ever been at. And sometimes, you know, the first one, like I said, ever hired. But I remember this picture has some, such a great backstory to it, which I wanna share, um, but I think you guys will appreciate. Um, so this is a five game series and we lost the first game. We lost the second game and we have to win the next three games to move on to try to get to the World Series. So we're at game three. We, we actually won game four. We actually won. And so now we're at the fifth final game. If we win this, we move on, which is a miracle for, for the bad news bears. And um, before each game, the bot, my, our boss would come up to us and hand us a pass. And he would say, okay, you know, Robin, you're on third and Mike Urban, you're on first. And, and we would get our assignments, but I was on third the whole time. Well, this particular game, my boss came up to me and he said, you're on first tonight. And I thought, oh, wow, moving on up, you know? Um, and so after the meeting, Mike, who I love and adore, who's extremely talented, walks over to me and he's like, Robin, I really want to be at first. I've been there the series would you mind switching with me and I looked down at my past and I looked at him and I said you can have it absolutely and he's like oh thanks so much so um this is now now we're at the fifth game it's the bottom of the 11th we're at extra innings and um you can't hear yourself think because you're sandwiched between two, like 19 photographers on the third base like little dugout for the um, press area and the 
the kingdom that we were shooting in has a, a, a roof on it. So all the noise is just really obnoxiously loud, right? And you can't hear yourself think. And here comes, um, oh, Griffey's on first base. And here comes Edgar Martinez. He's our home run hitter, our fourth batter. And he's doing his practice swings. And right at that moment, I thought, quick, quick, what have you learned in the past that's going to help you in this moment? And I'm literally thinking like this. And I look down at my camera and it says I've taken 25 out of 36 pictures. And I'm like, oh, change it, take it out, take it out. Well, you know, Edgar's doing his practice swing. I'm like, if I dropped it or if I load the new one wrong, I'm kind of in trouble, right? So I take it out really fast, put it in. And then here comes Edgar and he hits the ball down third. And here comes Griffin. He's running down second. He's running around third and he gets to home plate and he slides in. And I'm just like kind of spraying everything I can possibly, you know, you just go on autopilot, right? And this is manually focused and it was film. And you have to change your exposure at home plate because it's like 250 at 28. In the field, it's 500 at 28 at 3200 um, ISO. So here comes Griffin. He slides in home plate. All the Mariners run on top of him. And I go, boom, boom, I'm out of film. This picture is the second to last picture on my roll. And so I always say in life, be kind and be prepared. That's my motto for this picture. So um, one of the great uh, honors I received in um, was at 24 years old, I was voted by Life Magazine as one of the top eight photographers in America. Um, I like to say that was my swatch watch ad there, but um, that was something that, um, I'm just really proud of, and um, it was it was really fun to be a part of. And one of the biggest honors for me, and I truly mean this, um, I've been a, a Nikon ambassador since 2013, and I remember the first campaign I shot um, for them, and I, I, I had, was on a ladder, and I had to put the camera down, and I, I think it was a 3200 that I was shooting a campaign for, and the uh, producer looked at me and they're like, are you okay? I'm like, I just need a moment. Um, here I am holding your amazing camera and photographing somebody else holding your camera. And I went back to that 15 year old, you know, dream of being a photographer. And here I am holding the best camera, you know, for the best camera country in the world. I mean, I've only shot Nikon my entire career. Um, and so, you know, Nikon, thank you. And I'm very proud to say that, that uh, one of the greatest honors and joys of my life and um, this picture was taken in um, Norfolk, Virginia. And there's, there's also something to, to say about this picture because everybody else was like on top of this, these, these soldiers were leaving for the Gulf War. And I was a photographer at the Virginian pilot with the famous um, Bob Lynn as my boss. And um, you know, the pic photographers I were working with were, were like were just amazing. Um, you, you would probably know a lot of them, but anyway, um, everybody was on top of this soldier. And I remember this is a really tender moment. You know, this poor guy's leaving his kids and wife for the, for the war. And so I stood back with a 300 and I remember it was a little backlit and this was slides. We were shooting transparency then. And I remember thinking to myself, it's a little backlit, but okay. And I go, boom, boom. And cut to this picture has been everywhere. It's been inside Life Magazine, AT&T bought it from me. The USO brought it from me. Um, life used it on the cover um, with, I always kid, I made it with Bart Simpson. Um, and then they had 350,000 pictures to edit for that one square. Um, so I was very, very proud of that as well. And then as Susan mentioned, I was a Pulitzer Prize nominee for a story I did on a runaway. Um, I spent four months following this girl living on the streets with her basically, not spending the night there, but I spent a lot of time um, doing that. It was a very big eye opener as well. Um, so I, I want to talk about following ch chapters in your life. You know, we all have an inner voice, right? And we should listen to that inner voice because it's our, it's our guidance system. At least that's my belief. And I remember, you know, thinking I was a photojournalist for 16 years and I knew it was time to close that chapter, right? This is where we're going to get to the personal project part. Um, I didn't know, you know exactly what I was gonna do. I knew I was gonna freelance. I was doing a lot of weddings at the time. I was uh, did Paula Abdul's wedding and Carmel Electra's wedding. And I just realized, you know what? I need to follow this path. And so I went in freelance. And um, yes, that's me with straight hair on the right. And that's uh, Jennifer Aniston, uh, her 40th birthday party. Um, and so the celebrity thing started calling and they started pulling me down towards LA. I live in Seattle. And I'm like, wait, I just built my dream house up here in Seattle in the mountains. So I was living half LA, half Seattle. And um, I just started doing, you know, whatever came my way, which was amazing, like 
amazing opportunities. This is the king and queen of guitar. And I photographed um, their daughter's wedding and then um, portraits for them and spent a week at their 20,000 square foot um, palace in guitar, which was amazing. Um, favorite, favorite guy, uh, got to photograph him. And that was just truly, truly an honor as well. Um, and so my first, I guess, personal project was when um, I got asked to do a letter to my dog, which is the book on the left. And what a, my assignment was to photograph dogs and by themselves and then celebrities with their dogs, right? Um, and then we had a contest for 20 people to win and like bloggers, they could, you know, write a letter to the dog and we would pick 20. So it was 57 people, 37 celebrities. So my job was to fly around the country and photograph um, these dogs and with their owners and dogs by themselves. And this was, you know, really challenging to, if you think about it, right, I think I photographed 70 dogs total, something like that. It's really challenging to come up with um, different pictures of dogs because it's, uh, and, and it's going to be that my next project is the same thing. It's, I always like to challenge myself and try to get something a little different. This is obviously Tony Bennett. Um, horrible view that he has. <laughs> um, and I got to do some amazing things, amazing opportunities. You know, Robin Roberts mm -hmm. and, um, with her puppy. <laughs> what was that? Oh. Um, and then Oprah. Um, Oprah actually called me after this picture. And um, it's funny, she's called me seven times. And let me, let me tell you, believe me, you count when Oprah calls you how many times, right? So um, I actually missed this per, this picture in my first edit because sometimes I, I move fast, right? And um, I something told me to go back to my edit, which is something I've tried to, to teach myself over and over again, go back for a second edit, third edit. And when I went back, I saw this one when you know, they're both kissing each other basically and their eyes closed. So, so that was um, one of the um, projects that I did it was kind of a personal project on the side, but um, it was actually given to me. So it was kind of a combo. Um, this is Tony Bennett and I on Good Morning America. My friends tease me. They're like, hey, you told me you're going to be on Good Morning America with Tony Bennett, but I didn't know you're going to be with Tony Bennett. Um, that was kind of an amazing opportunity as well. Okay, so now I want to get to where my life pivots again. So I was a photojournalist for 16 years, closed that chapter and went freelance, right? And I want to share with you that when um, I was, what well, gosh, I don't know, it was 2007. Um, my mom uh, was dying of cancer. And about seven years prior to that, I remember I was at a friend's house and I, sold this, I saw this old window and I saw this photograph in it. And I thought to myself, gosh, you know what? If I had one dream in the world to do what I, what I could do for a living, and I was already having an amazing career, my goodness. But if I could have one dream, it would be to create art and be just full-time artist create art for people's homes, you know, commercial buildings, that would be the dream. And to take found objects and incorporate with my photography. And I took that dream and I set it on the back burner thinking, oh, that's way too good to be true. Come on. Right. And I'm not ashamed. I mean, I'm not ashamed. I'm not scared of following my dreams. I built a house at 33. I, you know, went after my career. I went, I was like, I'm moving to LA and photograph celebrities. Like, I don't, you know, I am a train. I have nothing that I'm fearful of, but that was just so big to me. So cut to seven years later, my mom is dying of cancer. And my whole life, my family, my brothers and I would say, mom, you're so talented. She was the most, my mom was the most amazing artist I think I've ever seen. And not because she was my mom, it's what I really believe. And as a kid, I would see her enter these contests and she'd always win best of show. And what she was creating was crazy. So my brothers and I would say, mom, you got to do something with this. And she'd say, no, no, no. So cut to 2007. And by the way, this is our artwork, obviously. The, the picture on the far left are horses that are on the back of the vase on the far left. It's a tornado that she kind of made it like a tornado. And then she added those horses with clay. The middle one she hand painted um, was a blank vase and the right um, cougar one, she took clay. Like, it's, I mean, who does that? Took a mound of clay and just makes this beautiful piece and then painted it. So 2007, I'm holding onto her hand. I'm, I remember it like it was yesterday. And I'm clasping her hands like this. And I thought to myself, you know what? this is, you know, when you lose a pair or somebody you love, this is a wake up call, right? And I said right then to myself, I am not leaving this planet 
without finding the art inside of me. I'm, I, I just I just knew it, right? So that's when I started my journey on my personal projects and doing my art. I was a hired gun for everybody else. When is it my turn, right? When's it my turn to show what's inside me, wherever it is? And hopefully I have a, a little of... Uh, a little of her talent. So my first personal, personal project was this idea I had to drive across America and look for unique basketball hoops and then the childhood hoops of famous people. And I was going to interview them and ask them about what their experience was as a, as a kid or their favorite hoop, like LeBron James, Shaquille O'Neal. And I'm like, I can do this. I can do this. So, so I got a van and I literally drove around the United States, 35 states, I think it was. It took me a total of nine months. And um, I didn't even have a book deal, right? And I got my friend Kim to go with me. Um, and it was talk about challenging. You know, we're talking about a hoop and a net and a backboard, right? So how am I going to make that look different? And how am I going to make that interesting? So I grabbed my friend and I have to tell you a funny story. So I called my friend who was out of work at the time. She's one of my best friends and her husband can hear us because I was on speaker and I said, Hey, I've got a crazy idea. Do you want to go with me or cause country? And even if you went for two weeks and we're going to do basketball hoops and you know, la la la. And her husband's in the background saying, yes, go the whole time. <laughs> so we ended up going for um, uh, uh, like six weeks and we drove across America and I didn't have a book deal, but I did get a book deal with Powerhouse Book, which is uh, Powerhouse Books, which is like the art wing of Random House. So um, it was one of the best and most fun projects I have ever done. Um, again, it was challenging. This is a reflection in a car. It was really hard to sometimes I'd get there and I'd be stumped, you know, and you couldn't some, sometimes you couldn't tell what day of time you're going to be there because you have to keep moving because you had so much to cover. So um, this book is called Hoop the American Dream. Um, I walked into the Cleveland uh, practice gym and the lights were out and I saw this across the room and my, and the guy who was giving me a tour said, let me turn the lights on. I'm like, don't, don't leave it. It looks like it is. So, um, and there's the book. So there's 31 players I interviewed, 16 men, 15 women. Um, Jerry West wrote my forward. You know, he's the guy that the NBA logo is silhouetted after and dedicated to the Boys and Girls Club. So this was a total personal project that opened up so many doors for me. I got, I got, to, um, I got asked to present at the best gallery on the West Coast, which is in Seattle, uh, Winston Walker. And I became um, an artist there, was represented there for four years. I, I mean, it, it, it just opened up so much. I, I sold out my first exhibit there and it's just crazy all the people that I've met through that as well. Which brings me to my second personal project. When the Seahawks won the Super Bowl, go Hawks, um, we went back to the second time. But in between those two times, we had a parade. And when, when the uh, Hawks came home, I was driving, I was a passenger and my partner was driving. And I looked up to this overpass and I see this guy holding a flag like this. This is the picture that started it. And I had this idea. I thought, you know what? wouldn't it be cool to capture the energy of the 12 fans? I'm sure you guys have seen this on, on TV, but our fans in Seattle are a little crazy. They're, they're, they're called the 12s and um, we're a little, um, uh, very passionate about our Seahawks. And so I thought, wouldn't that be a cool idea? So I went down um, to the parade and this is actually a, a reflection in a puddle. And um, I started shooting some pictures. Here's, here's the other one that started it. And what I try to do, and this is all done in camera, uh, as you've seen, a lot of my images are very literal. Um, and also a lot of my images are impressionistic. Um, and what I try to do is make it look like a painting and I don't do you know anything in Photoshop. I don't hit a button on an app. I mean, I, I really believe anybody can hit a button on any picture and make it look different or unique, but I think the challenge is to do it in the camera. And I get this question all the time. How do you do it? How do you do it? You know what I do? I don't, I shoot here. I don't shoot with my head. I shoot with my heart and I just play. It's a journey. It's not like I go out and get it every time. I can shoot something, the same thing 50 times and not get that sweet spot. No, it's not just out of focus. It's, I mean, it's like saying, well, that's just in focus, right? I mean, there's a lot of play that you could play with. And so it's settings, it's, it is focused, but I like for me to go recreate that again, I probably couldn't. It's just, it's a journey. And that's all the best way I can explain it. I don't have a, you know, formula per se. 
Um, so this entire book, which was a risk to do, is impressionistic. Every image. Well, the sea, this is an, another puddle too. Um, the Seahawks loved it so much. They're like, oh my gosh, you've never seen art of football before. And um, they decided to partner with me on the book, which was really exciting. So my job every Sunday was go, oh darn, was to go down to the Seahawk field uh, every Sunday that they were home and photograph them um, from, you know, from my book. And it was just unbelievable. I just couldn't believe I woke up and I said, I can't believe I get to go down the field today because the, they would give me passes. And I even got to go to the Super Bowl. So it's a, it was a personal project that I decided to do. It opened another whole ton of doors for me. Um, and it's just really exciting to be some, doing something that I'm passionate about, which is my motto in life is passion equals purpose. And I don't care if you have a full-time job, uh, you know, working wherever, we can all do a personal project, right? And I think it's what keeps life fun and find something that you're passionate about so you will keep doing it. That's the key. Um, so with it, I wanted to show you the next uh, thing I want to show you is a film that I did um, for Nikon uh, when the Z6 came out. The mirrorless cameras have changed my life. Oh my gosh. Um, and I, I think my top favorite thing is the EVF, the electronic viewfinder. Because in the old days, you know, we'd have to put the loop on the back and you have to attach the ring, the plastic ring, you have to get the loop and it would fall off. And it was just a mess. And now I can shoot video, we see it live and, and also see my stills live. Um, and so Nikon asked me when the Z6 came out, would you make a video? And so this is what I wanna share with you.
Um, I, uh, could you guys hear that okay? Was that volume okay? Okay. Um, you know, I want to tell you that, talk about personal projects. I became a filmmaker because when the D3S came out, life-changing for me as well. Um, I've always been told you should be a director, you should be a cinematographer. And when that camera came out, um, I did a video of my dog, Monkey. She's, she was the one that's the cover of the dog book. And it went viral. Um, and I, I became an instant filmmaker because um, Oprah saw it and I did nine films for her for their Super Soul Sunday. So it was a personal thing I did of my own dog, right? And then I just put it out there and then change, life changing. So another example, and I just realized that when I was watching, like, oh yeah, that's that was another personal project. Um, and it's funny when Nikon asked me, hey, um, think about a subject you want to do uh, for a film. And I had just been working on this, my next book, which I'm going to talk about on the lake. And I went, hmm, what subject do I want? Well, of course, it's going to be the lake. So um, thank you, Nikon, because that was super fun for me to do um, as well. Um, so my next project um, is the lake. I live across the street from Lake Washington. I'm very blessed. That's my little dog, Cowboy. And my dog on the right is Georgie. Um, I actually working on a children's book, which is my next project. Um, so you will be seeing them a lot soon. So um, there's, I, I photographed from the shores of Lake Washington. I shot from a boat. There I am on the far right in the front of that boat. Um, I shot above the water and I shot above, uh, on, on a pier. I shot everywhere for this, for this book for 10 years. So I'm, I just, I started out because I'd see a pretty sunrise and I, cause I lived further down the road from the, from the lake uh, originally. Um, I mean, I'm in the marsh up to my knees in, in water there. Um, and so I started having a folder of like, I'm sure you guys do this. Like you have a folder and you, maybe you shoot um, your, your dog and you have a book, you know, a little folder says, you know, spot, spot. And, um, and all of a sudden you've got this, you know, library and you keep going, right? So this is what happened with me with this book. I would photograph a pretty sunrise or I'd photograph the water. And all of a sudden I had this body of work and I thought one day I'm going to do a book. And I'm like, oh, no way. That is so much work. And about two years ago, two and a half years ago, I'm walking the dogs down the lake and I stop. And I said, it's time. And I felt like one of those people that have you know, voice on this shoulder that says, are you crazy? Do you know how much work and time and money that is? And this voice over here, but you have to, you have to do it. And so it was this back and forth with my, my, my brain. And um, I decided, you know what, let's go, let's do this. Well, the last picture of me getting in the water, I never get in the water. Um, I'm kind of a little fearful of it, but I thought, well, if you're doing a book on the lake, you got to get in the water, right? So I bought this Nauticam housing for my D850, another camera that I love. And I had two hours to go buy it and figure out how to use it because my friends were getting um, on this water with these baby ducks. I'm like, oh, I got to do this now. I'll talk about pressure. So I get in the water and this is one of the images that I have, which is actually behind me. You can't see the full thing behind me in my office. But um, wow, am I addicted to, to split water shots now? I mean, I can't stop, you know? So this was a whole new, you know, challenging thing. It's always, it makes it fresh when you can challenge and push yourself, right? Um, so this book started taking shape and I wanted to, um, do all the seasons as well. And there I am with the Nauticam and, you know, it's not fun sitting. Um, I've got to tell you guys a quick, funny story. So one day, oh, I'll show you when I did the picture. And this is one of the images from the lilies. I would just drive around the lake. I'm like, Hmm, what's under there? I wonder like what's under the lily pads. And so curiosity, right? Um, Another one, another, I love the way the pier looks in the back because what happens is you get water that drips on your lens. And then that's why you see the little squiggly lines in the back. That's what happens. And it gets all this really, really cool look to it. Um, another thing is I became friends with um, the rowing crew and the, the director of the rowing crew. And I said, hey, listen, um, do you mind if I get on the boats with you? And I, I thought to myself, I've never seen a picture with the oars going right by your lens. Uh, maybe they're out there. I've just never personally seen it. And um, it was really fun because the girls, they're all girls, all women, which is nice. And they're all wearing pastel colors, which I thought is cool because usually crew wears, you know, dark grays, black. So 
Another example of impressionism, if I shot this literally, I don't think it would, it would have the same feeling. Mm -hmm. um, so I love that, uh, I love that that's all the circles and the colors. This is an example of getting up early and um, which I have to do a lot. I'm sure you guys do too, right? For that light. And th this is like 5.30 in the morning. In Seattle, it's really bright early and it's really bright late. I mean, it's like bright till 11 o'clock here sometimes. And this is obviously in the summer and it was a triathlon. Um, and usually what happens is they have everybody on the, on the, on the grass to ready, get it ready to go in. But this day, this particular race, they're like, oh shoot, we have some issues with the the traffic up the road. So everybody just, if you want to warm up in the water and wait, you know, so you stay warm, uh, go ahead. And this is what that came from. So getting to events early for me was really crucial. And um, you, you, that's what I would always say as a photojournalist, the best pictures are, um, you know, before you get there and after, after the event and before the event. Uh, another picture of a split water shot. And um, I don't know if you guys have ever tried that. I think uh, Altex is another um, way you can, an inexpensive way to put a, a cover um, for your camera. And um, I just got one of those as well because my Nauticam so heavy and bulky, but if you need like travel or something, you could go on vacation and get one of those. It's just super fun and super addicting once you start. So just, just letting you know. Okay, this is a picture I was gonna tell the story about. So these are kids at the rowing center um, getting ready to get in their sailboats, right? And so I'm getting ready to get in, in with my big Nauticam and, and D850. And one of the kids says to me, oh, I wouldn't go in there. And I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, there's, there's like rats in there. I'm like, what do you mean there's rats in the water? He's no, I'm telling you. And so I looked at the teacher, I go, are you serious? Cause I had only been in the water like once prior to this. And the teacher goes, nah, there's none in there. Well, <laughs> A couple days later, I was photographing further down the lake and I see this, these two huge looking muskrats, I guess they were with big teeth and they're just like cleaning themselves on this rock. And I'm like, oh my God. And then they start swimming around. So I'm a little leery of where I go and they were swimming to the lilies where I was. So I'm very careful about where I go now in the water for sure. Another, it's always a nice surprise, right? When you're editing and you think, oh, I didn't even know um, that I had that. So um, again, it's it's just a fun exper experimentation. I love the colors in this image. I love the orange um, raft behind that lady or the girl, little girl and the, her red against that. And then the little boy's ears. If this had been literal to me, it just wouldn't be the same. So again, I try to capture the energy of things. Um, it's not easy. It's not me just throwing it out of, out of focus. Um, the word that really, can, you know, these, if you say the word blurry, it kind of is like taking fingers to a chalkboard for me. It's not, it's impressionistic or abstract. And it's, it's really um, a challenge for me to do every time. It's, uh, it's not easy. I must have photographed this blue heron, I don't know, 20 times to try to get this. And it just, it's about shooting it. And then you get home and you're like, oh, it's so close. But what if I did this next time? And what if I try this shutter speed? What was the shutter speed at that? Where what was my aperture? And it's about studying it and playing with it. And then maybe I do it this time of day, you know, and, and not just, I, I, all these pictures I'm showing you, I didn't just go out and go click, oh, I got it, we're done. No, this is a lot of, a lot of time and, um, and energy and like studying what I've done and haven't done. And um, I just love, love his, his um, I guess you call those feet um, and, and the, the way the wings are all dispersed and this colors, it all came to, together for me. Whoops, I have that one in there. Um, another split water shot, I actually was finished up photographing the rowers and I thought, you know what, I guess I'll, I'm, I'm cold, right? And I'm like, I guess I'll get back in and, and photograph these, these geese. And so I get back in and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. And I ended up getting the cover, which you'll see the same time I got this. Um, and so I constantly, even now, I have to push myself. I mean, you know, sometimes I don't want to go out and shoot. Sometimes I don't want to get in the water, but it's okay. If I don't, then I feel worse. So it is a lot of self-discipline, a lot of pushing myself. This is one of the hardest and one of my favorite pictures in the book. Um, again, wearing pastel colors. I don't usually see that. Um, this is uh, called, I entitled it Strokes. And 
again, it's the only frame I've had in 10 years like this. And it's about me just playing, right? Playing with exposure, playing with my settings. Um, and I don't even know, I, for me to go redo this again, just, I, I couldn't because I've tried. Um, and what that's, but that's kind of cool, right? Because it makes it special. Um, so this is definitely one of my, my favorite pictures in the book. This was fun because I, these are circles, you know, when you're standing there at the shore and, you know, we've all shot the circles um, from the water. But what I thought was cool is when the circles came against these weeds um, or grasses, it, they became in focus, which I thought was kind of fun. So even something as simple as grass, I try to make something pretty of. And um, I remember one of the one of the biggest compliments that I got was that people feel something when they see my images, which how great of a compliment is that, that they feel an emotion. And I it seems like I get out of the way of nature because it's easy, I think, to shoot dark subjects, but I think it's harder to shoot beauty for some reason. And um, so I just, I look at everything as, as beauty. I mean, it could be a leaf or it could be the water on a spider web, the drops on a spider web. It could be anything. Um, this is exactly how I shot it. There's no manipulation. This is actually huge in my house. Um, and this is just water, the way it, you know, it's always changing constantly and that's what I think is the most interesting to me about water is it's never it's just always different every time I look out my window every time I'm walking along like it looks different this morning I was walking and I saw four um, bald eagles and two were fighting over a, a fish it's every day and it's it's just so um, so special just to witness these things okay this is I woke up and I remember the date because it was July 5th because I didn't get any sleep the night before because it was July 4th, obviously. And there's this huge band of orange on the lake. Yes, I've seen strips of orange and, you know, from the sun reflecting in the water, but I've never seen it this wide. So I ran and got my camera. This was taken from my deck. And I ran and got my camera and I thought to myself, wow, wouldn't it be super cool if a boat went through the widest part of the strip, I mean, because I knew it would be silhouetted. Well, all of a sudden, I'm not kidding, like, oh, a couple minutes later, I had this, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I hope the boat goes to the widest part, you know, not the thin part. And then I see a skier, I'm like, no way. And so here comes a skier. And then I'm like, oh my gosh, there's a dog in the back of the boat. So that was, that was crazy. A lot of my job is anticipation and being prepared and waiting. So I have usually a camera in my uh, upstairs and a camera downstairs. And just in case, just, you never know, your dog might do something funny. Um, but I, I actually got an email and a phone call from the guy skier, skiing, and that is his dog, Charlie, in the back. And his name is Paul. And he ended up getting uh, a book from me. And um, so that was a little nice surprise that happened. Uh, I titled this End of Summer because it was like late September. And what I love about this picture is the only light in the picture is on the two guys, the two boys, but everybody else looks like they're freezing. You know, the lady in the ladies in the water with their arms clasped, but I love the silhouettes of the people, how they look cold, but um, the two boys are just sitting there, you know, warm as warm as can be with that beautiful light on them. I think that's pretty fun. Another picture of just getting up early while everybody else is sleeping. I'm out there with, you know, I got to get my dogs ready and get them fed and do their business. And then I have to get on the right gear. And, and usually I would get my gear ready uh, the night before everything would be charged up. My cards would be uh, formatted, ready to go. And so I didn't have to think I would just grab and go because you have to, because it's early morning and you gotta be ready just to get out and capture that light. So this particular morning, I, I, you know, sometimes you look out and you're like, oh, it doesn't look like anything, but you have this feeling. And so you'll see a little glimmer and you're like, I don't know, I have a feeling this could work. And so I love this because I've never seen this before living here where the trees come through the, the clouds. I mean, that to me was just spectacular. And, and sometimes you're standing there and you're like, is this really real? Am I really seeing this? Uh, another, another early morning. Um, love the orange and like I said it's sometimes it's just what nature gives you is is crazy it's one of my favorite things to do is is be in nature and photograph nature when nobody's around and this obviously is a reflection I just flipped upside down I think it's way more interesting um I think that was in the fall <laughs> this picture I got up and it was pitch black and I'm like I'm going out because I heard it was going to be a, a pretty day and I'm like okay the sun's going to come up I think it's going to be awesome and literally you couldn't see that far in front of you and I went down the bottom right onto the the shores of the lake 
And about five minutes later, I hear these people talking. I'm like, what's happening? And it's a boy and his dad getting in their uh, paddleboard, getting on the paddleboard. So they go off and then this, there comes this fog rolling in. And, and so they're gone for about an hour. And then all of a sudden, like the gates open, this light just comes out and it's all like crazy light. And they start paddling back. I'm like, oh my gosh, I prayed that he's going to go through there. And of course he did. Um, and that's just about, you know, having that anticipation, having that intuition about even getting up and going down there, right? And this, this was another thing that I worked and worked and worked. I noticed that this guy would bring his dog down and when he would exercise at the end of the pier, and then he would bring his dog and just throw the ball back and forth in between when he was doing his push-ups or sit-ups. And so I, I shot it a few times and I got some things I liked, but I thought, you know what, how can I make it better? And I think that's my motto in life, whether I'm making a little tag for a birthday present, right? Or if I'm um, cooking something, anything, I always think to myself, how can I make it better? And I just keep pushing myself until I get that feeling of, okay, we're good. But I always think that you can always make anything better, right? And so for me, that has served me well. And this is an example of that. Another early morning, uh, these are coots, C-O-O-T-S. And they're technically, technically not even a, a bird fowl, they say. I forget exactly the technical name, but um, the reason that these guys are usually taking off frantically, because they're all huddled together. I'm sure you guys have seen them and make that cute little noise and they have those white beaks. But they usually are making, um, a, flying off like this because either what I have learned, I'm not an expert in wildlife, but what I have seen and learned is it's either an eagle coming after them or there's an otter uh, or beaver in the water trying to get to them. And so they flop, get, take off and then they land again. And then they're like huddled together. And so you kind of don't know when they're doing it. It could be sporadic, um, but it's really fun to witness. And I think that's one of the best parts is you're learning about wildlife. Like I know now without a shadow of a doubt of an eagle, what he makes the sound or she sounds. And um, you know, an osprey, I know the difference because people come up and go, what is that? I'm like, oh, that's an osprey or that's a blue heron. And that's the fun part is when you, you know, knowledge is power, right? You love, I love learning about nature and um, it's, it's been super fun. Again, another example of the small things in life. I was watching a guy this morning, he's just running and there's two eagles, literally maybe 12 feet above his head. We're like, look, look, and he's just like, people are not awake. And I think if people were more awake, they'd be surprised what they saw. Even just this beautiful leaf at the end of this single stick. And I, I think there's beauty everywhere. Um, I was walking towards um, another end of the lake and you know how a tree is pretty tall up, right? With their leaves. Well, this was unusual because it was a bush with these beautiful leaves that I hadn't seen before. And they were kind of bent over close to the water I couldn't believe it. And it looked like to me, this picture looks to me like it's pressed metal. Again, exactly how I shot it from the camera to the paper. And what makes it for me is the leaf on the left there in the middle. But um, I couldn't believe that this was a tree that had all these colors reflected right there. Because like I said, usually I don't see that because usually it's so far away, but this was definitely a gift. I was finishing up photographing um, one end of the lake and I was coming back. And I remember my friend was with me and I, I was driving and I saw this scene. I'm like, oh my gosh, the only opening in the entire sky is this where the sun was coming. And I like literally pulled over illegally, um, which I'm known for doing as a photojournalist, right? That's what we do. And got this image um, and it's uh, another favorite in the book. So this pier I walk by all the time and it, it, it's different every day. And this is a beautiful, when that blue hour that we all love shooting in, right? This is a perfect example of what incredible uh, colors and light it is uh, early morning. And you wouldn't know it, but there's houses across the lake. This is just the fog. This is in the middle of, I don't know if you guys ever been to Seattle, but this lake, like it's 22 miles long. It's in the middle of the city. Like we don't, you know, but I, I, like, I wanted to shoot and capture the beauty of the nature around it. Um, same here. You know, when I decided to do this book, I had one more, let's see, I had one more summer, one more fall and one more winter to shoot. And I was praying for snow and the last picture of the pier and this picture um, were both uh, from that season. So I was so grateful that that happened. 
you know, it, it, a lot of anticipation, a lot of waiting, um, a lot of luck. And um, it's, you can photograph geese all day, but to sit there and wait for them to take off um, with, you know, cool light. This is just a foggy morning and um, happen to be there at the right place, right time. I, I love the reflections and um, their wings. And um, it was just, it was just really cool. I, it's funny, you know, I, I probably shot over a million pictures for this book. I'm not kidding. Easy, easy. And only 146 made it to the book. And um, I, I was, you know, pushing it to try to get to my favorite, favorite, favorites. And um, it's special when you find, they're, they're, I guess they're my babies when they actually made it to the final. From the, from the middle of that black that you're seeing right now, the strip across that, that's actually all reflection from the back, middle of the black to the top of the image. I just flipped it upside down. Again, I think it's way more interesting and I love the colors in the sky. I mean, that was just a magical, magical morning. Um, there's me in the Modicam. Uh, one of my favorite, thing, two things, right? Well, a lot of things. We we'll love photography. I love water. I love photographing dogs and, uh, and then love spit water shots. That was a really fun day as well. And this is one of the images from that. So I try to get something different. I try to get something that's, you know, not the same old, same old. That's the challenge, right? Um, and even this, like, I don't, you know, the lake doesn't really do waves, really. It's mostly ca pretty calm, but I love the softness of the waves on, waves on the left, and I love the, the waves on the, um, the little wave on the right. This was the image, um, if you remember the green, the split water green geese, and then um, I said I got the cover at the same time. I, I had to push myself to get back in the water, and this ended up being the cover of my book. And the reason they're a little transparent is their water got on the, my dome of my housing, um, which I think makes it really super special. And there's the book. Um, so the book, it's divided into four seasons. Again, this was, <laughs> this was a labor of love, right? This was me thinking, gosh, one day I would love to do a book. It's, you know, it is expensive to produce your book. I've had two books that have been published by publishers, you know, the dog book and my basketball book. And then the Seahawks and I did the book together. And then this is my first like on my own own book. And it is, it's very expensive. And I went for the highest quality paper. Thank you, dad, for teaching me that. Um, it's an 11 by 14 book. It's a, it's a thick book. It retails for $295. It's a signed and, um, and it's a signed edition and a numbered edition, meaning you know, it'll be 250 out of 2000 because there's 2000 copies and it'll never be reprinted ever. Like this is it. And so I wanted the book to be a piece of art itself. Right. Um, and that's why they're numbered. So if you, you, know, you get one, it says 788 out of 2000, you have your own special numbered edition. And, and that was really important to me. Um, and I wanted to price it where it was affordable still, but also special. So, so it starts with spring. And it has vellum between each season, a really nice thick vellum with um, a quote. And I had to get permission for the quotes. You can't just grab a quote. You know, you have to make sure that it's legally, you know, get it approved and get it, make sure that it's like, you can license it or not license it. But I didn't have the licenses, but I had to make sure that I, I could use it. Um, and so there's a lot of things to think about when you're doing this. You can't just go and do it blind, blindly. There's me, okay, so the other books, I learned a lesson. So if any of you that are out there want to do a book, if you can pre-sign them, because what happens is you get them from the publisher and they're shrink wrapped. Well, that's so nice when you can just hand one to somebody if it's pre-signed. If not, you have to open up, you know, the SRAM wrap, the SRAM wrap, the shrink wrap, and uh, which is fine because I personalize them too. But it's really nice that they're pre-signed and I, they're also, you don't see it here, but they're numbered too. So they're already numbered, they're already signed and they're already shrink wrapped, ready to go, which is really special. And that's my, I think I shot, um, I signed you know, 2000 of them, but um, that's my one my workshop with my, my garage. Okay, so what I wanna end here is, um, I wanna talk about being 21 and having a dream. You know, I've, I just shared with you about the power of personal projects and um, my, my being passionate. Um, but the reason I'm showing you this picture at me, this is me at Ohio University at 21 with a lot more hair. <laughs> I miss you hair. Um, and I got to, oh wait, first of all, I wanna ask, does anybody know what movie might've been famous during this time? 
Anybody? When Harry met <laughs> Sally? No, but that's a good guess. No? Um, flash dance. <laughs> so um, was it Jennifer Beals? Is that, is that her? So yeah, the hair and everything. Anyway, I just always like to say that because I saw that movie and I'm like, oh, I'm going to get one of those cool jackets like she had. So I'm 21 years old. I've got my donkey bag and, and I, I got turned on to um, Wyndham Hill music. And I'll, I don't know if you guys know, um, George Winston plays piano and then Wyndham Hill, the, you know, the Wyndham Hill samplers. And, you know, I was 21 years old and, and um, that's kind of young to be um, loving that type of music. But when I started listening to these samplers, like, you know, all different musicians on one, on one CD, whatever, um, I got really attached to this player, uh, guitar player, William, William Ackerman. And William Ackerman discovered George Winston and William Ackerman came up with the label. It's his label, Wyndham Hill Records. So I'm 21 and I'm like, gosh, you know what? One day I want to see this, this guy play live because his music changed my life. Like, you know, you cry to it you laugh to it, you, you're sad to it. Like it, it's, it's when I play his music and I'm out in nature, that's my church, right? That is when I feel the most alive. And I said, I gotta, I gotta see this guy play live. Well, I never got to never. And I wanted, so I, I, I put it out there that I want to meet and we'll cut to like, I guess it was three years ago. And, um, I became friends with this guitar player. I had an assignment to photograph one of Oprah's films and the guitar player and I started chatting and he, um, he came up to me, he goes, Hey Robin, can I give you one of my CDs? And I said, yeah, sure. And I get home and you know, sometimes people give you a CD and you're kind of like, Oh, so I don't really want to hear it. Well, I did. And I turned it over and it says it's produced by William Ackerman. And I'm like, Oh my gosh. So the next day I saw Todd and I said, Todd, you know, William Ackerman. He's like, yeah, I record with him all this time in his studio in Vermont. I'm like, what? He goes, oh my gosh, well, I'll introduce you. Well, cut to, they came to Seattle to do a concert together. I think this was 2019, like February, 2019. So two years ago. And um, he, he called me, Todd called me, he goes, Robin, Will and I is coming to Seattle. Do you want to meet him? I'm like, oh my gosh. So I went to his concert and I met him before. And then during intermission, Todd comes up and he goes, do you want to have a glass of wine? with Will and I. And I'm like, yeah. I said, I live a mile from here. You want to come to my house and have that glass of wine? He's like, yeah. Well, my whole house is my gallery, workshop, studio. This is where I, you know, I have clients come here all the time, architects, designers. That's what I do. And so I'm like, oh my gosh, William Ackerman is coming to my house. That's like, think of your favorite musician right now. I don't know, whoever, you two, whoever, and you, you become friends with them. And now they're going to come to your house. It's kind of fun, right? So couple months later now will and i you know we're uh, he comes over but he comes over after the concert and he walks in and he walks to the first piece of art in my wall and he goes oh my god i can't move and he fell in love with this picture of this uh these ducks faded in the water and i actually i didn't show it to you but it's in the book and he goes i can't move and blah 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 he goes whose artwork is all these uh pieces i go it's mine he goes oh my gosh so he you know was here for a couple hours it was incredible so a couple months later I had this crazy idea, right? I've got this book coming out. What if I presented my late book to an audience for the first hour, kind of like what I'm doing now, right? Telling you about the stories and everything. And then the second hour, what if Will plays live in front of my videos that I shot? Because I always, um, not always, I try to have two cameras um, going at once. So I'm shooting stills and then I set one on a tripod. And I'm doing the scene video, right? Is, you know, like the water or whatever. And then I'll, I'll have both video and stills. And I just did that on my own. So I said, Will, would you play live in front of my videos of the lake? He's like, I don't know what you're talking about, but I'm in because I love you and I love your work. So cut to, I shopped it around. I don't know if you guys have ever put on a music event, but like, I don't know how to do that. And um, it's a long, fun story another time, but I, I actually got into Benaroya Hall, which is where the Seattle Symphony plays and it sold out. Like, I can't believe this is happening. Um, and so I did, I presented the book and for the first hour and then Will played live in the second hour. And if you wanna see, if you go to my website, um, it's, um, it's called Benaroya Hall. It's, it was a two hour event. I condensed it down to nine minutes. If you have some quiet time with no interruption, turn up the volume on the biggest device you have and watch it. It's, it's very relaxing and um, it truly was the biggest night of my entire life. And I can't believe, you know, I've had this personal project, right? 
and then I do the book and then I have this idea, I meet Will and then I have an idea to do this, this event. It's crazy what can happen. You never know. So please follow your passion, do what you love, Const you know, just for any time, any anything you can possibly think of. Um, so I'm going to end with, remember that dream I had when, when I was holding on to my mom when she was um, dying of cancer? Um, well, I have followed that dream and what I am, I mean, I could be, I'm in tears saying that my job right now uh, for, for many years now has been to create art for private clients and they're pretty you know, high-end clients and um, commercial buildings. That's what I do. And um, at the very end of this, I'll show you a video that sums up in one minute what I'm doing now. But I mean, that's crazy, right? I can't believe I get to do what that dream was. And I am full-time artist. So I went from photojournalist to now I'm doing what just makes me the happiest of all. Um, this is a pier, exactly how I shot it. There's no color manipulation. This is lichen on a pier um, outside of San Francisco. I was in China. And uh, this is hanging in my home as well. This is, I love this picture because of the primary colors and, and I love the lines on her shirt. Um, I think it's pretty, pretty fun, pretty interesting. Um, one of the phone calls I got shortly after I decided to be an artist was um, Oprah Winfrey uh, called me and asked me, I'm still trying to take this in that this happened, but asked me to come to Maui for a week and photograph Maui and her dogs and her horses and create artwork for her new spa that she's building on her property. And I still can't believe I got to do that. I was there a week, we, she was there with me. Um, it was one of the best weeks ever of my entire life. And this is one, this is on her property. And then that's hanging in her, her house. Um, so she has a lot of, I think 24 pieces of mine in her house. Uh, this is one of the images I did for her. And this is hanging in one of the bedrooms. I think it's six buildings, 14 bedrooms. Um, which is crazy. This is in, uh, her kitchen nook. So that's one of the highlights too. And um, I actually shot this about a month ago in uh, Roy, Washington. A friend of mine was like, hey, come on out. And she's like, let's go see my friends. And I'm coming down this road. I'm like, are you kidding me? This is their driveway. And um, I just got out and worked it. And I love it. Again, to me, it looks like a, a painting. Another example of uh, an image I shot, Reflections on the Beach, one of my favorite things to do, and just flipped it upside down. And I can't believe of all the buckets this kid could have had in the world, there's different colored sharks on it. I mean, it's crazy. I did a film on a woman in Wyoming. She commissioned me to do a film on her life. Um, in fact, she just passed away recently. She was in her 80s. And she wanted to give, leave something for her grandchildren and um, her children. And so she was this famous artist in Wyoming. And so I thought, you know what? If I'm gonna go to Wyoming three times, you know, I went, to, I went there in the spring, I went there in the uh, summer and I went there in the winter. I'm like, I might as well go through Yellowstone and shoot personal pictures, right? Just get some personal images. And this is one of those where nobody was around for hours. And I wasn't, you're not supposed to be driving in the park when the snow's really thick on the roads, but I just did it. And um, I just kept going and going. And my friend's like, this is really getting dangerous. I'm like, just keep going. And it was tree after tree after tree. And then this opening just happened. And this bison was foraging for snow and he's going back and forth. And you can see the snow behind him as you know, he's pushed through, but in front of him, it's clean. And he was looking for food. And I get out and I have my, you know, I think it was like a 400 and I, the wind is whipping. It's like those Star Wars, you know, when those movies where they hit the Star Wars button and then the stars coming out. It was like that. And I'm, I was like, the wind's whipping me. I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't really see. And I'm like waiting for him to lift his head. And finally he does like for one second. And that and that's where this image came from. Um, this is an image I shot, believe it or not, in broad daylight. And it was a cow, a highland cow in this field Another, per these are all personal things that I did because I love what I do. And um, I've sold this picture. Um, I've, this is one of my most, I actually have somebody coming over today to, to purchase a huge uh, version of this. And this is a 90 by 73 in a client's house. This is what I do. They come over, they look at my work and they're like, you know what? I'm thinking for this wall, can you come over and measure? And, you know, we figure out the treatment and how it's produced. But this is in broad daylight. And this cow was one of like 26 in this field. She was the only female. And all the guys, for some reason, the farmer told me, 
didn't like her. And what happened was my friend who's a designer goes, you should shoot Highland Cows. And so my other friend, I tell her this, she goes, oh, I just saw a field of them, field of them on Vashon Island. So I go visit her. She goes, come on over. So I get on the ferry, I go to the island. And we, I literally knocked on the stranger's farm, you know, farmer's door and said, hey, can I photograph your cows? And he's like, yeah, come on out. And so he was telling me this story, how she's always by herself. So she's under a tree. And this, I was just starting to photograph her. I didn't know, I didn't know I had this until I edited, when I got back and edited it, edited it. And um, all of a sudden this light comes through the leaves and it lights her mouth and she has grass in her mouth. I'm like, oh my gosh. So this is one of the, this one and the bison that I just showed you are the two most popular that my clients gravitate towards. Another example of clean shooting, right? I love clean, uh, clean backgrounds. This actually, I shot it with a white background and just changed it to black. It was a, a gray day and I shot this down in Palm Desert. A client hired me to photograph bighorn sheep down there and um, ended up doing this one as well. Sometimes I take my found objects. Um, these are found objects. Um, these are found molds, like foundry molds. And what they would do is they would take these wooden molds and push them in wet sand. And then they pull them out. So there'd be an impression in the sand and they would pour hot metal. So these are like from the 1800s. Well, when I got these two, I thought, oh my gosh, that looks like film containers. Cause we used to, you know, hand roll um, our own film back in the day, black and white. And there's actually uh, 40 pictures on this strip right here, 40 on that roll. Cause I over rolled the film. And um, this is actually hanging in my dining room. And uh, my whole house is my art because that's what I do. And people come here. And um, I learned from my ex that she's like, why are you having pick other people's art in here? This is your, you know, where you show. I'm like, hey, yeah, right. So it's really fun because it, I'm surrounded by, well, I call them my babies. So this is one of my babies. And then when the pandemic ha happened, you know, we, as all of us, we had to pivot, right? And so um, my artwork starts around 4,000 and goes up from there. So I thought, okay, I need to get something. People are working from home. I need to do something that's more affordable for, for most. And, and so, you know, maybe do something for under $1,000. So these are my smaller pieces. There are still limited editions. Everything I do is a limited edition to make it special, right? You don't want 5,000 copies of your art out there. So um, these are really fun and they've been doing really well. And um, so it's funny how we all have to think of new creative ways to reinvent ourselves, um, which I'm always looking for creative ways to express my art. Um, here's another example. The picture on the left is one I shot of, of the lake and the one on the right, it was made into a rug. It was these, these rugs are hand woven in Nepal by the best rug um, designer maker in Seattle, all the high-end homes. Um, uh, go to get their rugs there. And I'm proud to say the first rug I sold was to Bill Gates, believe it or not. So we have the same rug um, and that rug is in my living room as well. Um, so it's really, it's kind of mouth dropping when you walk in and you see your image that's been, you know, hand woven out of silk or bamboo. Um, it, it's, it's really, really crazy. Um, there's another one. There's my picture of uh, twigs on the left and it was made um, on the right. That's also my house with, um, with the rug. So it's been really um, fun to, to push the limits and to think of different creative ways to express my art. Um, so I want to end by showing you, I told you earlier that um, I uh, have a, a one minute video that I want to show you that kind of sums up everything. But I wanted to say it to everybody, you know, a lot of, sometimes I get stopped by fear, you know, like, I don't know, can I do this? Am I Am I good enough? Am I, can I do this? I think all of us are feeling the same thing. And I think if you just follow, find something that you really, that just makes you rush, right? Something that makes you happy. It could be anything. And don't worry about what people are going to think and just do it. And when you find something you're passionate about, you'll keep doing it, right? Um, and that's what I've done. I've just I just follow the path and I, and like right now I'm working on a children's book, which is actually one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. I'm, I'm like at a writer's block right now, but I see it, but I, I'm just going to keep pushing. And then, um, I'm always have something in the works, always thinking about what do I want to shoot next? What do I want to photograph next? Like I want to photograph, um, elephants. I don't know why it's just popping in. So I'm going to figure out how to do that. And I know horses have been photographed a million ways. And you might say to yourself, yeah, but 
photo, you know, everybody's done that. Well, but you haven't done it and you haven't done it your way, right? So it, find your own style because, you know, it, there's, I mean, yes, it's flattering to be copied and all, but who wants to be copied? You know, find, find your own style because there's only, what's that saying that uh, be yourself because everybody else is taken. If you could find what your passion is, find a different style experiment. And, and just a personal project, you have no idea where that's going to lead to, right? So with that said, I'm going to just show you a one minute video of, of some projects I've done recently. So. Thank you, Robin. That was so fantastic. So many oh. really uh, inspirational photos and great stories behind so many of them. It's it's really fun to hear the backstories on so many different things. Oh, thank you. We've got um, a number of questions here. Um, I'll try to keep them grouped together. Uh, so many people are expressing um, just how beautiful your work is and how much they appreciate the stories and. Uh, Aww. Uh, Jay Drown says, loved every minute of your presentation. Wow, amazing, so creative, fabulous. Lots of great words for you, Robin. We've got several um, alumni in the house that connect with you. Uh, a Sandusky Register alum, Matt Kishore. Oh, Bobcat. yeah. Yeah, and a Bobcat alum, Sydney Scott. All right, Bobcat and Sandusky, double. Yeah, and then of course a lot of Seahawks fans. So. Oh, all right. Now you guys are spoiling me. <laughs> <laughs> People are connecting with you on a lot of different levels here, so that's fun. And, and you know what? I hope it's okay to say if anybody wants to follow me on Instagram, I sure would appreciate it because um, it's really fun for me to look at your work too. So it's a great way to to connect. So, um, as far as some questions. Um, I made notes here, so I apologize if I don't attribute the question to um, the person who asked it every time. But where are you publishing or displaying personal projects outside of the outside of the books, the ones that get published? Um, well, as far as um, well, my website, of course, but I do a lot of talks and I do some exhibits. Is that what you mean? Like where where can you see some items? Is that what the question is? I think so. Um, People just want to know when you're not making a book out of it, where do you put it? Oh, <laughs> um, well, I, I exhibit a lot. Um, I'm giving a talk like at University of Washington and they're going to have some art pieces there and I'm doing a book signing there. So um, it either lives in art or it lives in my books. Nice. Are you fitting your projects into regular freelance work or are you now dedicating yourself to each project? Um, well, I still freelance a little bit. I'm actually flying um, Monday to LA for a couple weeks for a couple jobs, but I would say 99% of what I do is what I just showed in the video is uh, creating artwork for um, clients and commercial buildings. And like an example would be, I had this client say, hey, we live in Palm Desert. We really love the big horn sheep. We want something humongous. Um, and thank you, Nikon, for making something that's 45 megs so I can you know, make sure they're sharp. And so what I'll do is just go down to, uh, to Palm Springs for uh, three or four days and shoot and then show them my take. And then they say, we want this one. Just looks like I did for Oprah. You know, I, I shot for a week and then showed her the take and then she picked which ones she wanted. So that's mostly what I do now. Um, this is my question. How do you make those connections with celebrities like Oprah and um, 
and you answered the one about how you made the connection with the with the musicians but you know um they kind of come to me um i i don't reach out to them per se you know they get inundated you know all, like a million times a day um it's kind of word of mouth and they you know, would come to me and as far as the celebrities for the book I will say that um, I have a friend, uh, Michelle Marciniak, who's a basketball player. She worked, she was at Tennessee with Pat Summit, and um, she hooked me up with Annie Myers Drysdale, who's a, a, a famous women's basketball player. And what happened was one person would connect me to the next. So for this book, she was, oh my gosh, you got to talk to Rick Barry. So here's Rick Barry's you know, email. So I email Rick Barry, and then Rick Barry calls me and says, oh my gosh, you got to talk to Jerry West. And he goes, wait a minute not Jerry, his wife, Karen. And so I get, you know, it's kind of like the domino effect. I kept getting for the basketball book for the celebrity thing. They come to me, but for the basketball book, um, I just, it was just connected. And then what really changed for me is when Karen, I sent Karen a PDF where the book was in progress. I mean, it hadn't been a book yet. And I sent her a PDF with some pictures. She goes, oh my gosh, I've never seen anything like this before. How can I help you? And then she hooked me up with Shaquille O'Neal and LeBron. And that's how that happened. But as far as the celebrity thing, um, you know, they came calling to me, you know, you do an event or you do something and then somebody gets wind of you and, you know, celebs, they want what everybody else is doing. And so that's sort of what happened. But for the hoot book, I was connected by one to the next to the next. Cool. Is there uh, anybody out there that you wish you could work with or do some art for? Um, yeah, there's a few people um, that I would like to do. Um, I mean, you know what, here's the thing. I don't care if you're the janitor or the queen of guitar, right? I just wanna do what I love to do. And I had the big, one of the biggest compliments to me was I was shooting a wedding, gosh, 20 years ago. And this videographer came up to me, she's, you know what I love about you? I don't care if you're shooting for a janitor or the queen, you give a million percent to every job you do. And, and I do, I don't, I just, I wanna make people happy. I wanna make sure I overachieve what they wanted, overproduce, over uh, give them you know, what they want. And I think that I eat, sleep, drink photography. I mean, that's what I've done my, since I was 15 years old and I haven't stopped. And so, um, yeah, I mean, of course, I'm sure I have my favorites, of course, but I, I just wanna just keep going and doing what I'm, you know, um, I, I can't say who I'm flying down Monday, but it's a pretty famous person. And, um, you know, it's just that they found me through such and such. And it just is like a domino effect, you know. Awesome. Uh, Jason Halley wants to know, did you face any criticism to pursue personal interests over stability of other photography careers? Was there anyone who thought you no. couldn't make it taking pictures for yourself? No, but that's a great question because it reminds me when I was in college, um, I never forget. I, I had even, I didn't even have really a portfolio. Yes, I had to have a portfolio to get in. You would just, you know, I don't remember how we sent it back then, but I had the student come up to me. I was a freshman. I was already homesick. And he comes up to me. He goes, you know what? You're never going to make it. Do you know how he didn't even see any of my work, right? He's like, you're never going to make it. Do you know how hard this profession is? Everybody in the grandmother wants to be a photographer, which is true, but you might as well just pack up and go home. And I don't know what made that guy say that to me, but I used it as fuel, right? I use it for fuel to fuel me forward and fire, you know, me up. And, um, and it's funny because like two years later, I was like, I think I've won second college photographer of the year or something like that. And so I look at those comments as I, again, use it as fuel and, and, you know, don't say no, because no means yes to me. <laughs> so I haven't really had anybody. I think people say that uh, how fortunate I am. I mean, I live in a beautiful home. I live on the lake. I, I get to do art for a living. I mean, oh my goodness, Susan, if there, there's not a minute that goes by that I'm not grateful for what has happened to me and how I live my life. And I am really blessed. And I know that. And I think the key to life is gratitude because the universe isn't going to give you what you want. And so you're grateful for what you already have. And um, I really believe that. And you're not grateful to get things. You just got to be grateful for, you know, we're alive, we're breathing, we're healthy, you know, just be grateful along the way. I think that's really important. I love that. And I think that um, especially comes to light during, uh, you know, what we all just experienced in this last year. Yeah. There's it's a time to reflect, even though, you know, I, I was by myself all the time. I mean, I know people have families and stuff, but, you know, I try to just concentrate on the things that I do have, not what I don't have. 
And I think there's a lot, lot to that. I agree. Um, David from Central Washington wants to know, was it difficult to maintain a work-life balance with such an all-encompassing project? Did you have Lake FOMO versus Life FOMO? <laughs> um, no, I guess for me, you know, what do they say? If you uh, love what you do, you don't work a day in your life. That's me. Um, I don't really, it's funny. Yes, I, I've been told I'm one of the hardest people, working people that any people know. Um, my ex used to say, you're definitely the hardest working person I've ever met. But to me, it's not really work. I mean, I guess it is, but it's so passionate for me. Like, you know, I mean, I don't know, even though I'm working next week and I'm, I'm, I'm already like doing, I'm going to be doing personal projects the whole time in, in LA for two weeks. I mean, I already have some ideas and that to me is the rush. The minute I stop rushing, I'll stop. But I, I've been rushing <laughs> since 15 and I'm, and that's what I mean. I don't care what you guys do for a living or, you know, it, you can always find that side hustle that makes you rush, right? I mean, we all, we all can do it. That's the beauty of photography. We can do it no matter what we do for a living. We can always do it. Chris Gannon wants to know, who do you use for your e-commerce and photo finishing and how did you go about selecting that? Um, well, for my prints, I have, let's see, I've used a company in LA. I, I have people here in Seattle. Um, it's just depending on what, you know, there's a company in New York. It just depends on what somebody wants and um, what the project is. So it just depends. And then back to the book, um, I can't find where that question was, but I remember someone asked if you had help editing for um, the Lake book, but really any of your books, or do you do that completely um, on your own? So um, I kind of a one man show. Um, the funny thing is I edit on photo mechanic. I know everybody uses Lightroom and uh, other, other things, but I, I'm old school, you know, and, and it's funny because I'm not a technical person. I'm not a, Hey, how does the light do? Da, 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 da. I'm like, I don't know. I just know, like, I like this picture. I just shoot with my heart. And that's why I want to say to people too, like, you don't have to be technical. I mean, yes, you got to know how your camera works. You got to know how to work your camera. You have to know, cause it does a lot of amazing things, but, um, I just say, you know, shoot with your heart and, and, and go that for me that's what works for me i'm not a technical person but now i forgot your question <laughs> i'm rambling here. i'm rambling i see somebody wrote flash dance twice woohoo sydney and stephanie way to go that's right. one yeah uh jay wants to know about um about fear he says thanks for discussing facing fear do you have specific strategies or activities to move past your fears when starting Ooh. a project you know, um, I think fear is when you have fear about something, you know, you're on the right path. I, I remember seeing this show. I don't know if you guys ever watched that show, The List. It's uh, one of those nightly shows. And I remember thinking there's three things to be successful. I'm like, of course, I'm like, you know, recording as quick as I can. But the first one is to invest in yourself, right? Because we all have fear. We all are like, oh, should I get this computer? Should I get this website? Number one, the most successful people, invest in yourself, wherever that is. Like I said, website, um, you know, tools for your trade, whatever. Two, if, if it feels like you're at a risk, you're probably on the right path, right? Um, and so it's about believing in yourself. And that fear, I would use as fuel, like I said, and you know, I'm scared to death about this. I have two assignments back to back next week. And let me tell you, it's scary. I mean, I've got publicist, publicists, I've got the head of CBS I'm dealing with, or I email me like, this is what we're looking for. I'm like, ah, you know, yeah, I'm nervous, but I think that's good. Because if you start thinking, oh, I've got this, I think you're kind of in trouble. I think you should have those butterflies and be a little fearful, but also I'm scared of flying. I'm, you know, I do it all the time. And I think you just face the fears, just take a deep breath and look at the bigger picture and just breathe and say, I've got this, you know? And, and I, I have fear all the time. I mean, I'm human just like everybody else. Of course, I'm going to be terrified next week and be so glad when it's over. So uh, yeah, I think that's a good thing though. Uh, Jeff at Rice University um, says, during COVID, I've enjoyed shooting personal work more than ever in my life. My only outlet is social media. Any tips on getting your work seen? Well, that's a good one. Um, you know, I see all these people with a million followers. Well, of course, that's the dream, right? But um, I would say just keep posting. I'm not the best at like hashtags and what to do with that. Um, I try, 
Um, but I think, you know, Instagram, of course, is the number one um, uh, outlet. And I think just keep learning about how that, that operate, you know, that works and maybe hashtagging. Um, and then also I noticed like on my account, you can see view insights and you can kind of see where people are learning about you, whether it's hashtags or uh, if they're followers, et cetera. But um, I'm not the best at that. There's people better than that, but me, but you know, I do the best I can. I'm pretty sure I have um, just everything that I see in the chat. If I'm wrong about that, uh, somebody please call me out. If that's all the questions, um, I think I'll back over to Glenn. Robin, thank you so much. Your, um, as several people have said, your your energy is contagious and your images oh, are so inspiring. And we're so thankful for you um, spending time with us today. Oh. I hope you stay in touch with us. Oh, absolutely. You know what? And thank you guys. Thanks you to everybody that that, that came and listened. And I, it's just been a real thrill for me. So thank you very much. Thank you, Robin, and thank you, Nikon, for providing uh, Robin uh, for us. Uh, this is stunning work. I mean, I think everybody is kind of blown away by uh, what she Aww. did. So, absolutely amazing. Um, so, uh, we have uh, Michael uh, Dion with us, who is our Nikon rep, and uh, we're going to pass it over to Michael. He's going <coughs> to tell us a few things and. Uh, Stay tuned because at the after Michael's done, we're going to talk about the Nikon shootout. So go ahead, Michael. Well, hello everyone. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, I mean, first off, wow, Robin, what an amazing presentation! Uh, thank you for sharing your beautiful art with us, as well as the great stories behind the images, um, and for being a Nikon ambassador. And what a great uh, representative of the Nikon brand. Yeah. Uh, I'm I'm happy to be here today uh, to represent Nikon. We're happy to be a part of the symposium and. Um, I'm just going to talk to you guys for a few minutes today, and then if you want to join me to talk Nikon a little longer, I'll be in the the breakout room tomorrow for the for corporate sponsors. But I'll just talk to you guys for a few minutes today, kind of what's going on with Nikon now. Um, hopefully, you can see the big beautiful Nikon logo there. Uh, my name is Michael Dion. I'm an NPS representative. That's Nikon Professional Services. Um, so you know, I spend a lot of time supporting pros around the country. A lot of really great benefits to MPS. I think one that is pertinent is uh, priority delivery of, of new products that are a little harder to get um, because of demand. Um, all right, so you know I travel around the country a lot, working gigs for Nikon and doing things like um, letting people try gear at, at zoos and botanical gardens. Um, I've gone out to, to a lot of nice national parks to do uh, workshops on uh, night sky photography. And you know, sometimes they send us out to, to really cool events to support the pros. So like at the you know, first day of 2020, I was out at the Rose Bowl, um, had the chance to shoot on the sidelines a little bit with the Z6. Um, and you know, I was thinking, okay, this is gonna be a great year for live events, but that didn't really end up being the case. Um, but I, I started kind of my own personal project in 2020, um, found my new favorite subject. And I've really been enjoying the Nikon Z series for its ability to to track focus on eyes. It's made any port work, portrait work I do way easier. Um, so that's really been, been a lot of fun. But um, let's talk about the Z system. I mean, we've been using Nikon F-mount lenses, SLRs since 1959. And uh, it was only in 2018, we sort of um, switched things up and we're moving in a mirrorless direction. So we, we launched a brand new lens mount for the first time since 1959. It is the widest diameter lens mount in the industry for 35 millimeter cameras. Uh, it also has the shortest distance from lens to sensor, which gives us some, some great image quality benefits. Uh, pretty interesting seeing the two mounts side by side. We've got a significantly smaller camera with a significantly larger mount. So um, yeah, very, very good stuff happening in the lens lineup here. You know, this is where the, the system started in 2018. Very modest, just two cameras, three lenses, and our, our FTZ adapter to, to connect everything to the uh, F-mount SLR lenses. Um, the end of 2020, we were up to six cameras, 16 lenses, and two teleconverters. So the system has grown really fast. And you know, it's not just the speed that impresses me, but the, the quality of each release as well. And we're going to continue to see the system grow uh, quickly. Um, we just announced another four lenses that are coming soon, um, in addition to you know, basically every F-mount lens still being compatible with these cameras. Um, so just, oh yeah, I mean, I almost forgot one of the biggest announcements we've got, um, biggest products being launched this year 
our, our first mirrorless flagship camera, the Z9. We haven't released a whole lot of specs here, so stay tuned for more to come this year, but um, you know, it's sure to be a groundbreaking camera. Um, and here's our sort of current lens roadmap. So uh, plans for 27 lenses by the end of next year. Um, and so the two new ones we just announced are a 28 millimeter 2.8, very compact, almost pancake style lens, and a 40 millimeter 2.0, as well as two macro lenses, uh, a 105 and a, a 50. So um, yeah, a lot of good stuff on the way. If you guys want to talk to me more about you know camera settings, uh, products, NPS membership and benefits, um, I'll ask you all to please join me tomorrow in the, the breakout session. And, and with that, thank you all so much for, uh, for joining us today. Um, and thanks again, Robin, for that fantastic presentation. Thank you guys so much.